Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Uh, today I am coming to you with what I am going to call the beginning of my bookshelf tour. Uh, I asked a couple of months ago over on Instagram when I was running extremely low on video ideas, what are some things that y'all would like to see me film? And the overwhelming answer I got was a bookshelf tour. And there are many reasons why I have yet to film a bookshelf tour, uh, namely because until genuinely this past year, I didn't have enough bookshelves to put all of my books on. Uh, so I have a shelf upstairs and I will insert a clip of it that is my main bookshelf, has been my main bookshelf uh, for many, many years. And as you might can see, it is stacked two and three deep. Uh, and so that's largely why I've never done a bookshelf tour up there. I now have a smaller shelf there uh, where I have kind of themed things based on Shakespeare. I have a Shakespeare shelf. I have a King Arthur shelf and I have uh, kind of a Renaissance Italy shelf and then I have my TBR cart which is in absolutely no kind of order. Uh, now this shelf down here that you typically see me film in front of does have a semi order uh, and so this would be fine and then I do have a newer bookshelf that is in my bedroom that holds a lot of my other uh, classics collections. But I thought maybe what would be an interesting thing to do and would make this actually doable for me is to split the bookshelf tour up. Uh, so today I thought that I would focus on Penguin Classics. All of the Penguin Classics I own that are not uh, the Penguin English Library, I thought that would be uh, a good idea for another video is to do all of my kind of collectible classics. So these are all of uh, kind of the older mass market paperbacks that they no longer print, uh, the older trade paperbacks, and then of course the newer black spines, uh, which typically sit right here and they are missing, as you can see, because I've already got them ready to go. Uh, I do have a lower shelf here that is also all of my Penguin Classics, the older trade and more of the newer black spines. Uh, so we will definitely get to those, but I say we get right into it. First, I will show you these, my little mini mass market paperbacks. These are in no particular order. Uh, so mostly though, I would say these are ancient classics. When I was in school, uh, I often used to get these because I thought they were easier and more portable to carry. Unfortunately, they are not very good for study purposes in my opinion. There's not enough room in the margins to make any kind of notes. Uh, the first we have here is The History of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth. This is an 11th century classic that was taken as a very serious piece of historical work for a very long time, but uh, unfortunately it is not. It's a very very legendary source. It's really a lot of fun and there's a lot here that's about uh, King Arthur. Uh, so if you were into the original Arthurian myths, I think that you would probably really like this. Speaking of King Arthur, I of course have Le Morte d'Arthur. This is part one by Thomas Mallory. Uh, and then I have volume two by Thomas Mallory in an entirely different edition. These are not the editions that I ordered. I thought I was ordering the kind of newer uh, trade paperback, the Black Spine Classics, but this is what a book sent me. Uh, and so they're not even in the same series. I was fairly, fairly unhappy with that, though they are done by the same editor. I do like Le Morte d'Arthur. It's not my absolute favorite of the Arthurian legend and the old kind of medieval Arthurian classics. I really like the French tellings more, uh, but I do really find Thomas Mallory fascinating because he fought in the Wars of the Roses. So I think I really need to give these a reread because apparently his experiences in the Wars of the Roses and uh, with King Edward IV and everything really influenced him when he wrote this. And so I think that would be really fun to kind of read this classic through that lens. These are kind of the really old mass market paperbacks, uh, but this is Aeschylus's Prometheus Bound. It also has the suppliants, Seven Against Thebes, and the Persians in it. I was not the biggest fan of Prometheus Bound, but I do genuinely like Aeschylus's other works. I have not read the suppliants or Seven Against Thebes before, so I definitely need to dive back into this and complete this collection. I also have Orestes and other plays by Euripides, who is one of my favorite ancient Greek playwrights, and I highly recommend him. Uh, then I have the Oresteia by Aeschylus and the translation by Robert Fagels. He's most famous for translating uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey and the Aeneid. If I'm not mistaken, I've never read his translation before, so I would be really interested to read it in this edition. 
The Oresteia is the only remaining trilogy of ancient Greek drama that we have, which is a really sad, sad thing, uh, but it's absolutely incredible if you have never read it. I do think it's a pretty good place to start with ancient classics. If you've been nervous about them, I think reading one of the ancient Greek plays uh, is a great place to begin, and this tells a full and complete story. And then I have Lucretius's On the Nature of Things, or Dererum Natura, as its Latin title. This is a piece of ancient Roman philosophy that I frankly don't think I fully understood, uh, and I don't know that I care to. I didn't really get on with this. This is a classic from the ancient world that I really can't say I enjoyed. Uh, I do think I need to read an updated translation of it because the last time I recall reading it was in school uh, and it was not a wonderful experience that much I can tell you. Uh, so I definitely should probably look for an updated translation. I have Livy's The Early History of Rome. I love Livy. Everyone loves Livy. Livy is an ancient Roman historian, uh, and he's a lot, a lot of fun. Uh, so the early history of Rome surrounds kind of the time of the kings uh, and Romulus and Remus, the foundation of the city of Rome. And Livy wrote a monumental history of Rome that contained something like 140 books, and unfortunately, not all of it has survived to the modern day. This is, if I'm not mistaken, the first five books in his history of Rome. If you've never read Livy before, I don't think you can go wrong starting at the beginning. I also have Ovid's Metamorphoses, uh, and this is an epic poem of the ancient world that I absolutely adore. Uh, Ovid is basically retelling all of the Greek myths to a Roman audience, and it's really, really beautiful. Uh, these smaller editions typically will translate epic poetry into uh, prose, which is not my favorite thing. Uh, so I really have this basically to be a portable edition, and I have definitely carried it with me. I really enjoy Ovid and I love his writing and I think he's a very approachable ancient writer. So again, if you were looking for a place to start with the ancient world and ancient classics, uh, I think Ovid would be a great place to start with Roman classics. I think Aeschylus would be a great place to start with Greek classics. I also have a small edition of the Aeneid by Virgil. This is also translated into prose, which bugs me, but it's also a very portable edition. It's nice to have these little editions, in my opinion, just to throw in your bag uh, when you're going somewhere or if you're traveling, if you're getting on a plane or something like that. These are easy to take with you and you don't feel quite so bad about messing them up because they can really take a beating. Uh, this is the W.F. Jackson Knight translation, which I will tell you is not my favorite. Uh, I think of all of the ancient classics that I've read, and it might be because I have read a lot of the Aeneid in Latin, I think the Aeneid is one of the hardest to translate. I think it's one of the hardest to get right. I think there are a lot of Latin classics that are kind of difficult to translate or kind of difficult to uh, bring into more modern language, uh, and I think the Aeneid is one of them, and I just think this is not the best translation to go with. Uh, I still recommend the Alan Mendelbaum translation. I also have Caesar's The Civil War. I'm not a big fan of Caesar as a writer, as a person, any of it. Uh, I'm not really into Julius Caesar. I do feel as though he's a figure that's really worthy of study, uh, but his writing has always graded on me. Again, from being a Latin student, Caesar's Latin is probably some of the easiest to translate, so you're always given a bit of him to get you started, and just the way he talks about himself in the third person, it's so, so grating. Uh, and so I am not the biggest fan of his writing. I do think the Civil War is the best of what he has to offer, though. Uh, he does have De Bella Gallica, which is about his kind of conquest into Gaul. And that's also pretty decent, but I don't like that as well as the Civil War. The Civil War is the only piece of Caesar's writing that I own, and I think it'll probably stay that way. Uh, last but not least of these small mass market paperbacks is The Rise and Fall of Athens and Nine Greek Lives by Plutarch. Uh, I really, really like Plutarch. I wish I had more of him. This is basically his history of Athens in Nine Lives, like I said, and some of those lives are semi-mythical. Some of them are real historical figures who are really, truly engaging. I think Plutarch is the best ancient historian. I really do think he's so much fun to read. I just genuinely love him, uh, and he does inject a lot of drama and a lot of probably good fictionalization into these stories, which make them really, really fun to read. I just enjoy Plutarch and I do need to be on the hunt for more of him. 
So now we'll jump into the trade paperbacks that are a little bit newer than most of those mass markets, uh, but look very, very similar to them. Uh, so these are on this lower shelf here typically, and I do have an order to these. Uh, these go in chronological order. And that's my preferred way to organize any set of classics as I just love a chronological order. So the oldest of these trade paperbacks that I own is The Lives of the Later Caesars. This is a really interesting source from kind of the later Roman Empire, which is one of my favorite time periods. And I love classics written at that time. Uh, this is a really interesting one though, because we're not quite sure who wrote it or what the purpose of writing it was. Uh, sometimes it is said that six authors contributed to this work, but they pretended to be one man writing it. And then other sources will tell you that one man pretended to be six different writers when he wrote this book. Uh, and so you're not quite sure whether or not to take this seriously as a historical source, which is unfortunate uh, because it's a really good look into some of the later emperors in the empire. This was written as a sequel of sorts to Suetonius's 12 Caesars. This is one that I haven't read yet. I would like to reread Suetonius and then dive right into this as if I'm reading a series. Uh, so I will let y'all know how I feel about that when I get there. And perhaps I was wrong on whether or not that was the oldest. I do have The Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. And I think this is older than The Lives of the Later Caesars. So I do need to do some adjustment. This is one of the most popular ancient classics ever written. Uh, a lot of people love this, including people who never really studied ancient classics in school, who are not classicists. A lot of people really like Marcus Aurelius and his writings. This is a piece of Stoic writing and the Stoic philosophy uh, really went on to influence a lot about Christianity, which I find fascinating. And I actually really like a lot of other classics that are written about Stoicism. I unfortunately did not take to this the way that so many other people have. I did read it for school. Uh, so I sometimes wonder if maybe that contributed to how I felt about it. I'm definitely due for a reread. Uh, so I should probably do that pretty soon. This is the year of rereading for me in 2021. Uh, so maybe I should put this on the list. Then we have The Love of My Life. These are my school copies of Dante. So I have The Inferno, I have The Purgatorio, and then I have Paradiso. So they are all sorts of marked up and written in. These are some of my most treasured books. Uh, and truly, these are the copies of Dante that I will carry with me throughout the rest of my life, I'm pretty sure. If you don't know anything about Dante, you should definitely read him. Uh, on a list of books I would tell everybody to read, I would tell everybody to read Inferno at least. But I do think the Divine Comedy in whole is really, really beautiful. And I also really like La Vida Nuova. I have an edition of La Vida Nuova that is not by Penguin, so I didn't include it here. Year. but uh, I really really love Dante this is of course his epic poem about traveling uh, through the Christian hell purgatory and then into heaven and he meets a lot of really uh, wonderful historical figures along the way and he is so creative his outline of what the afterlife could look like is really ingenious uh, so these are my favorite classics on my shelf then I have the Decameron by Boccaccio which I have not yet read and I know I know I should, but the reason that I'm always a little bit intimidated by it is because I did not have the greatest experience with the Canterbury Tales. And I know that this in many ways influenced Chaucer's writing of the Canterbury Tales. Uh, and so I don't know that I'm really gonna get on with it. I don't know that I really like that format because I'm not always into short stories in the modern day. And that's kind of how this is set up is that uh, several citizens of Florence are fleeing the plague. When it comes in 1348 and they are in a country villa and they tell stories to pass the time away. Uh, and so I've heard some stories are really quite excellent. Others are not good at all. Uh, so I definitely should read this fairly soon. Uh, I don't like this edition of it, unfortunately, because the person who had this before me <laughs> wrote um, a lot of lewd notes in the margins. Uh, and I am sure that that's partially what Boccaccio was going for, uh, but I am thinking that I should probably get a newer edition of this so that I can take my own notes in the margins if the mood strikes me. So these are actually apparently in no kind of order and I need to go back through them because I believe I am coming to an earlier work here and this is a title that I am definitely going to butcher. Uh, the Mabinogion, 
but this is a Welsh medieval classic. This is also, in a way, a short story collection. There are 11 stories here that are filled with a lot of Welsh mythology, and they're really, really wonderful. I really enjoy the Mabinogian. I love Welsh history, and I love Welsh mythology, and I love books that deal with them, and this is one of the few classics we have that I think does deal with it quite so explicitly. Uh, so this is a really valuable source that we have, uh, and it's also a whole lot of fun. Again, if you like King Arthur and you like the older... Uh, retellings of King Arthur, you would probably get on with this because I definitely see some similar themes going between them. Another medieval classic that I have not yet read uh, is The Alexiad by Anna Comnena. Uh, and this is a history of the First Crusade written by a woman who was the daughter of the Byzantine emperor at the time. Uh, and she lived an incredibly interesting life. She was constantly plotting to overthrow and kill her brother. Uh, so she was a really interesting figure in her own right, but it's interesting that one of the most valuable sources we have on the First Crusade uh, was written by a woman and in the Middle Ages at that. I just think it's really interesting. I am looking forward to reading this because I've heard it's quite a wild ride. And I took a Crusades course when I was in undergrad, and I don't recall ever discussing her and ever discussing her work, which is really interesting. So I am definitely intrigued by this and I'm hoping to pick this up soon. So then I have the Neva Lungenlied, which is a German classic and it is epic poetry. Uh, and so I am really excited about this because I believe I've read this in part before, but not in whole. Uh, and it's also a version of the story that is told in the saga of the Volsungs or Volsunga saga, which is one of my favorite Norse sagas. Uh, and so I am just really, really excited about this. So this is one that I am definitely really looking forward to. Jumping from the Middle Ages into the Renaissance, I have The Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer, uh, which is one of my favorite books of all time, one of my favorite classics of all time, another epic poem. I picked this edition up recently used uh, because I thought it actually included the whole of The Fairy Queen and I got very excited, uh, but unfortunately it does not. It's very hard to contain The Fairy Queen. It's very, very long. Um, this is an epic poem that deals also in a way with Arthurian legend, chivalry, things like that, uh, which I really, really enjoy. Uh, so this is one of my favorites of all time. I love Edmund Spencer. I really recommend it if you were willing to take a chance on such a big honkin' book, uh, but you can definitely read it in part. You don't need to read it in full. In fact, I'm not totally sure that I've ever read it in full. I know I've read it piecemeal over the years. So this is another of my favorites, and I believe it is the first English classic that we have reached on this bookshelf tour. Next, I have The Sorrows of Young Werther by Johann von Gotra, which I know I am mispronouncing. I am so sorry. Uh, this is a German classic from the 1700s, and it is thought to have kind of brought on the age of the Romantics, uh, which is why I picked it up. This was a very short book and a very, very upsetting read. Uh, and I don't know that I totally got it. I didn't get on with it when I read it, uh, so I'm definitely due for a reread of this. Uh, but this was a work that really took pop culture by storm. I mean, people were trying to dress like the main character further. And that's a really interesting thing to think of is a classic that definitely took the world by storm. Next, I have Edward Gibbons' The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, uh, and I am disappointed in this edition. This is a heavily edited edition editing down a multi-volume work uh, into one book, and I think it cuts some of the most interesting parts of Gibbon's works. Uh, so I would definitely like to get the newer Penguins that I think have done all of them, but in three separate volumes. I think that's what I'm going to have to invest in because I definitely want all of the decline and fall of uh, the Roman Empire. Uh, so this is another classic that is from the late 1700s, and it is a very, very important piece of historical scholarship. This really changed the way we wrote history. It changed how historians were able to put their bias on the page in terms of what they were writing about. It's a truly remarkable piece of work, not just in terms of telling uh, how the Roman Empire fell, which is a really fascinating period to me, uh, but it's a really instrumental work in how we write history today. So the last of these older trade paperbacks that I have is Armadale by Wilkie Collins, which was one of my favorite books of 2020. Wilkie Collins is one of my favorite uh, Victorian writers. In fact, he probably is my favorite Victorian writer. Uh, and this is a really fun sensation novel that I highly recommend.
So now we move on to the beautiful Penguin Black Spines, which are probably the editions of classics that Penguin is most famous for. Uh, so I also have several of those down on this third shelf here, and they are in chronological order and in better chronological order than uh, the other trade paperbacks were in. I'm sorry I even said that was in chronological order because that was an absolute mess. Uh, so that tells me I need to do some bookshelf reorganizing when I'm done filming here. Uh, but in this stack right here, there is absolutely no order. I just have things collected here that really won't fit on this third shelf. Uh, so we can do those first. Let's go back to the great Dante. So I have the portable Dante, which includes uh, Inferno, Purgatorio, Paradiso, and La Vida Nuova, uh, which is a collection of poems that he wrote prior to the Divine Comedy. Uh, and so this is in the Mark Musa translation, as are those older penguins. I really like Mark Musa's translation. It is the only translation of Dante I have read in full, uh, and it's not because I necessarily think it's the best. I know it's probably not the best out there, but it is the one that I read Dante first in, uh, and so I am fairly attached to it, I think. Uh, so I got this edition of Dante when I was in Florence in 2019, walked right out of the bookstore, started reading it in the neighborhood that he lived in, and it was a really wonderful experience. I have another edition of Dante. I do, in truth, have at least four editions of the Inferno uh, because I'm very interested in translation. Uh, so this is the Divine Comedy Hell, uh, and this is in the Dorothy L. Sayers translation, which is an older translation that people swear by today. Uh, I don't know that I necessarily like it. I think she's a little bit stilted, but I want to read more of it before I give it that huge of a judgment call. Uh, Dante wrote in a bit of an interesting rhyme scheme, uh, and she, I think, tries to replicate that. It's a very, very hard thing to do in English. And so most translators kind of ignore that that's what he was doing. Uh, I believe Dorothy L. Sayers tries to replicate that, and it's not always successful. Uh, so I would definitely like to read more of this very soon. I also have the Penguin Black Spine edition of the King James Bible. I have this edition mainly because it includes the Apocrypha, uh, which is really interesting. They are books of the Bible that are not included in every Bible. I believe the Catholic Bible includes the Apocrypha, uh, but Protestant Bibles do not. Uh, they are kind of contentious books that people will argue should or should not be included, uh, and they're very, very interesting. Uh, this is a really wonderful resource. I thought because it was a penguin, there would be some interesting scholarly notes on it. There really are not. Uh, there are very, very few notes here. And of course, it's huge. You see why. I thought that there would be better notes than there are here, but there are at least some that give you a little bit of information about what the Old Testament, what the New Testament, what the Apocrypha are, uh, who wrote which book of the Bible. So it does have some interesting notes, but I thought to be a Penguin classic that it might give me some really good, interesting historical or scholarly detail, but it does not. But I do really like having an edition of the Apocrypha on hand. Then I have a more modern classic, which is Vera Britton's Testament of Youth. Uh, this is her memoir of working as a nurse in the First World War. And I believe every man in her family, man that she was close to, died in World War I. Uh, so I have not picked this up yet, mostly because I know it's going to be a very difficult read when I do get around to it. Next, I have Our Mutual Friend by Charles Dickens, which I have not read yet. I also have Hard Times by Charles Dickens, which I am interested in reading very soon. I think it will probably be the next Dickens that I pick up. I also have The Mystery of Edwin Drood, which was Dickens' last novel, and it is unfinished. I don't know now when I'm going to get to it because I don't think we have any sort of clue how this book would have ended. I also have Great Expectations by Charles Dickens, which is one of my favorite classics of all time. This is a book I would definitely recommend to get you into Victorian classics. If you have not read any before, uh, this is one of the first books that I read to get back into Victorian classics, uh, and I highly, highly recommend it. I think it's a very approachable read. Next, we probably have my second favorite classic of the Penguin editions after my old Dante's. I treasure all 
of my editions of Dante, uh, but I really love my old ones. But uh, this is The Lives of the Artists by Giorgio Vasari. This is probably one of my favorite reads of the past five years. Truly, this is spectacular. Uh, this is a piece of nonfiction uh, that was written in the 1500s by an artist about other artists. He was writing biographies of the most famous Renaissance artists of all time. This is unfortunately a heavily edited collection. So not all of the artists that Giorgio Vasari wrote about are in this book, which is very unfortunate. I have heard that the Everyman's Library Edition does include all of them, uh, so I may have to indulge in that. Uh, but this is a really, really wonderful classic that I highly recommend if you were into the history of the Italian Renaissance. Next, I have The Civilization of the Renaissance in Italy by Jacob Burkhart. This is a 19th century classic of nonfiction about the Italian Renaissance, of course. Uh, and this is apparently also a very instrumental piece of historical scholarship uh, that changed how we viewed the Italian Renaissance, how we discussed it, and certainly how we wrote about it in terms of history. Uh, so I am really interested to getting to this one. This is one that I have not yet read, uh, but I am really looking forward to it. Next, we have Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. This is the 1818 edition. She did have a revised edition that was published in 1831 that is apparently very, very different to this one. And the 1818 edition is the one that I believe most scholars would recommend you read. Um, Mary Shelley is one of my favorite classic authors and Frankenstein is one of my favorite classics. If you have never read it, boy, you are in for such a treat. This is a book right here, honestly, that you wish you could forget about and read again for the first time. It is truly that brilliant. Next, we have The Letters of Vincent Van Gogh. Uh, this is a recent purchase of mine that I am really excited about. I do kind of feel as though I need to read a nonfiction on Vincent Van Gogh before I dive into this, and I have one about Vincent and his brother Theo, uh, so I think I will read that before I dive into this, but I have heard only good things about this collection of Vincent's letters. Last but not least in this stack is The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Uh, I am currently reading this. I've kind of put it down for the time being in order to join in with a read-along that is going to be happening in February. Uh, but I am really enjoying this so far. I think his writing is absolutely beautiful. So now we'll move on to this shelf down here. Uh, and these are also in chronological order, but I do feel as though they're in better chronological order than those older uh, trade paperbacks. Uh, but I have pulled them out in such a way that we will be going backwards in time. Uh, so we will be starting with the newest classic and moving back into the ancient world. We will be going back to ancient Greece. Uh, so let's just get started. The newest classic that I own in any edition of A Penguin uh, is The Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov. Uh, and I have heard this is a very weird one but this was published in the 1960s, if I am not mistaken, and I don't know how I am gonna feel about it. I think in theory, this is one that I will really enjoy, but in practice, I don't know. Uh, so this is one I'm very curious about, and I'm hoping that I can get to it this year. I have heard that it is just such an absolutely wild ride. Continuing back in time, we're going back to the Victorian period. Uh, so we have Mary Barton by Elizabeth Gaskell, uh, which was one of my favorite classics that I read in 2020. I really, really enjoyed this. This is an industrial set novel that has to do a lot with social issues at the time, which I really appreciated reading about. I love Elizabeth Gaskell. I'm not the first to say that. I won't be the last. Uh, she's one of the best of the Victorian period, in my opinion. I then have Romola by George Eliot, or Romola. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that, uh, but this is George Eliot's Italian Renaissance set novel. Uh, and I have tried to read this so many times, it is not funny. Uh, and I just think her writing is so dense. I don't know that I will ever be able to completely get through this, which pains me because the Italian Renaissance is one of my favorite time periods and I will read almost any book set there. But, but what a treat it would be to read a Victorian classic that was historical fiction set in Renaissance Florence. It doesn't get any better than that. But I am definitely going to return to this one and hopefully I will push through it one day. I then have a collection of poetry by Alfred Lord Tennyson. I have a good feeling about Tennyson. I have not yet read anything by him, but I do feel like The Lady of Shalot will work for me at any rate. Uh, so I am definitely looking forward to trying this. I think I might save this collection for Victober. 
I then have The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde uh, by Robert Louis Stevenson. This is not my favorite classic of all time, I will just say that. This is probably one of the classics that I had the highest expectations for, and thus it really fell short in my opinion, which is a real shame, but I know a lot of people love this one, uh, so maybe I should reread it. Then I have Nathaniel Hawthorne's The House of the Seven Gables. I am both excited and apprehensive about this one. This is one that I have not yet read. I, of course, have a past with Nathaniel Hawthorne, having been an American high school student who was forced to read The Scarlet Letter and who was then scarred by it. Uh, what a horrible reading experience that was. And I've heard from a lot of people who picked up The Scarlet Letter on their own that it's not a bad book at all. In fact, it's really quite excellent. Uh, and so I'm hoping that his writing will work better for me in The House of the Seven Gables, which is apparently very gothic and scary. Uh, and it's also apparently in the vein of a romantic novel, which I think I will really enjoy. Then I have The Tenant of Wildfeld Hall by Anne Bronte. This is one of my favorite Victorian classics. I really, really love this one. Uh, this can be a bit of a heavy read though, and I think it's a very open discussion about marriage, uh, specifically marriage in Victorian society and how that was very hard for women. Uh, and I think it can be a harrowing read in places, but it's also just extremely good. Next, I have Villette by Charlotte Bronte. Uh, I have DNF'd this book before, and in many ways, I wonder if I will ever return to it because I don't think I was all that impressed by the first hundred pages. This is apparently a semi-autobiographical novel for Charlotte Bronte. Uh, so in that regard, I am very interested in it to see the parallels to her real life, but it didn't feel as though it was going to be that eventful of a read. Moving back in time, we are now in the 1700s. Uh, I have The Letters of John and Abigail Adams. This is one that I also haven't read, but I am really excited about uh, because I have heard their letters are just really wonderful and romantic. And I have heard Abigail Adams in particular has some really stellar quotes. Uh, and so I am looking forward to this, especially because I would love to see the American Revolution through their eyes. I don't know that this is one that I would ever read straight through, uh, but it's definitely a good one to pick up and read here and there. Just read a letter every now and again. Uh, I'm really excited about this one. Uh, next, I have James Boswell's The Life of Samuel Johnson. Uh, and no, I have not read this yet. Uh, I got this to participate in a read-along last year, and I really fell off with it because I found the introduction alone so intimidating. Uh, this is one that I think I will like, but I do feel as though I need to know more about them as people. I need to know more about who James Boswell is and who Samuel Johnson was uh, in order to really appreciate this, I feel. Although a lot of people have told me you absolutely don't need to have had any kind of background with them. This is one that you can just dive into. Uh, but this is a really interesting piece of uh, classic nonfiction. But I believe this is apparently rife with classical illusions. And it's apparently also always talking about literary developments. Uh, so this is one that I'm excited about. I don't know physically how I will ever read it in full. Uh, but it's definitely one to, again, pick up now and again and read a little bit here and there. I then have an edition of Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift, which I have not read uh, and I don't have the best feeling about, I'll tell you. So I have absolutely no clue when I would pick this up and I really am not quite sure that I will like it. I then have A Journal of a Plague Year by Daniel Defoe, uh, which I read last year and really enjoyed. It was a very harrowing book. His prose is very enjoyable, uh, and I found it really engaging for an 18th century classic. I have not really delved too much into the 18th century side of things, so reading this really helped my fear of 18th century classics go away. Uh, so this is one I tentatively recommend. I just think you need to be in the right headspace for it. Dropping back in time to the Middle Ages, uh, we have Njal's Saga. So this is a Norse saga. I have not yet read this one and I'm really excited about it. Of all the sagas I have left, and I'm sure there are tons and tons and tons, uh, I am really excited about this one because apparently there is a really interesting character uh, in this who is a warrior who doesn't like killing. I believe his name is Gunnar. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. I love a Norse saga. I know that they don't work for everybody. They're very weird and they're set up very oddly nine times out of ten and it's a thing where if you don't like the structure of one Norse saga 
you probably just don't like sagas in general, if that makes sense. Although I personally believe there is a Norse saga out there for everyone. Uh, this is one that I am really, really looking forward to. Next, I have The Prose Edda by Snorri Sturluson, uh, which is an Icelandic classic that you should absolutely pick up. Oh my gosh. If you love Norse mythology, pick this up. Uh, the prose and the poetic Eddas that were put together by Snorri Sturluson are some of the most important sources that we have on Norse mythology. Uh, he was writing in the late 11, early 1200s uh, when Christianity had taken hold in Iceland and thus stories of the old gods were fading away. Uh, so he very much wanted to kind of immortalize and write down those stories so that they wouldn't be forgotten by later generations. Uh, so I just really, really love the prose Edda. I like the poetic Edda better and I wish I had the addition of that in this. So this bookshelf tour is telling me what I need to be on the hunt for uh, but this is one of my favorite classics on this shelf. We are falling back now into the ancient world. Uh, so we have Procopius's The Secret History. This is a classic from the 500s AD during the reign of Justinian the Great. He was a Byzantine emperor and he was married to one of the most interesting women in history in my opinion. Theodora. Uh, and so this was written by somebody who was in their court, but it was not published until this guy died. So people often wonder, did he not publish this because this is really the way he felt about their regime? Or did he not publish this because he wrote it as a joke? Uh, so people are not quite sure how to take this, but this is a very uh, dark and judgmental look at the reign of Justinian and Theodora. It's also one that I haven't read, but it's very short, so I hope to get to it very soon. We have Suetonius's The Twelve Caesars. Uh, so this is a really wonderful piece of ancient Roman history uh, telling about the lives of the first 12 Caesars, including Julius Caesar, who was not a Roman emperor. Uh, this is such a fun classic, and I highly recommend it to everyone who wants to get into ancient Roman classics because I think it is so much fun. It is genuinely like sitting down to gossip with a friend. It feels like you're back in high school, meeting up at the lunch table to talk about what somebody did in first period. That's Suetonius. He's genuinely somebody that you feel like you get to know as an author through reading this book. You definitely see his biases. It's really a lot of fun, and this is a classic that I highly recommend. Next, we have another edition of Ovid's The Metamorphoses. This is in verse. This is a verse translation, uh, which is why I picked this one up as well as that smaller mass market paperback. Uh, I really like Ovid, so I enjoy having a couple of different translations of him. Ovid is another one that people say cannot be translated. I don't know that that's necessarily true, but I do see how it's difficult for a translator to do their job well with Ovid. Uh, so this is, again, an epic poem from the ancient world that I highly, highly recommend. It's dealing with all of the most famous ancient Greek and Roman myths. Then I have an ancient Greek classic, which is The History of the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides. This is one that I have not gotten to, but is on my yearly TBR for 2021. Uh, so I am really looking forward to this, but I don't know that I will really like it. A lot of people say this is pretty boring to be ancient history, uh, which is a little bit disappointing to hear. Then we have Aristophanes's The Lysistrata, uh, and Aristophanes was a comedic playwright from ancient Greece. I have also not read this. This is one of the few collections of plays and one of the few authors of the ancient Greek world that I have not yet delved into, uh, and so I kind of feel as though I'm saving it, but at the same time, I know it's probably because I won't like it. I don't think the comedies play as well for me as the tragedies do, so this is another one that I don't know when I will get to uh, because it kind of feels like I'm saving it for a special occasion. Last but not least, we have a penguin black spine that apparently has tried to escape from its place on one of these shelves, uh, and that's The Betrothed by Alessandra Manzoni. Uh, this is an Italian classic from the 1800s that is apparently a really wonderful, sprawling historical fiction set in the 1600s in Milan. I'm really excited about this one because I do love Italian classics, and I can't say that I've ever read a classic Italian novel, so I think this will be a really wonderful reading experience. So those were all of the Penguin Classics that I own. I would love to know if you have read any of these down below, uh, if you recommend any, if you have a favorite Penguin Classic, I would love to know all of that down below. But that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.